Um, three things. I'll pull up a little bit. Um, and this is from reporting. Uh, we, we were covering Jakarta in 1998 together, and I was in Malaysia. But I, I, I'll do three quick things if I have time, and then um, I'll speed through them. But the first is really you have to look at it from the front lines. Uh, and for me, technology is critical. So I want to quickly take you through that. The second thing is conflict reporting has its own challenges. I'll just show you very four points from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from South Asia, and then the Philippines. The minorities always get it. In Indonesia, it's the Christians who are the minorities. In the Philippines, it's the Muslims who are the minorities. I've seen it from both sides. Um, and then the last part is, again, where do things go? Because I think the solution is actually in technology. So I just want to remind you the things we've lived through. I turned 50 this year. And I was a, a journalist in my 20s. I just want to remind you about the technology. This is how I began, pen and paper. Right? And then uh, you had to go run out and get a payphone and tell your editor what was happening. Uh, now you can live tweet. I've been live tweeting what we're doing. This is how I started. Remember, you have to actually pound the typewriter. Um, and you had to do it fast. So we still pound our computers today. And our 20-somethings in Rappler actually tell me, why are you angry at your, type, at your computer? Um, and then I want to remind you of this. When the computer came up, the floppy disk, uh, the facts. In 1987, when I was running the Manila Bureau for CNN, it was magical to put your script in, have an editor in New York or Atlanta come out magically with all the edits. That was incredible. That was 1987. And last year, one of our guys, Rappler is less than two years old, um, one of our 20-somethings came up to me and said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, that's a fax. And then he said, how do you use it? So I had to show him how to use it. So what was so revolutionary at the beginning of my career is now an antique, right? Um, remember Pocket Bell Easy Call? This was such a, in the Philippines and in Indonesia, it was a sign of batch, kind of, you know, you're kind of important. Remember how magical that was also, right? You get a beep, you call a number, you have to go find a payphone and call a number, and then you get a, an operator tell you the message, and then you get to send your message back. We don't have to do that now. One tweet of mine can reach 200,000 people. That's kind of cool, too. And then this. Uh, in uh, 1987 or 88, CNN sent me something that looked like a suitcase. Um, and I thought, wow, let me open the suitcase. It was the first cell phone. And the suitcase was this, like, basically this big. And I had to carry it slung over my shoulder because it was so heavy. Now it's this. I carry two or three of you. We, we can carry more than one cell phone. Just reminding you, it's all from late 80s until now. <laughs> this is how I started a team of four. Four people on the coverage, right? And when you're in a war zone, you actually can go away for a week or two and not have to file. That's important because right now that's impossible. You're reachable anywhere. You have a sat phone now, right? So look at the technology and how it's changed. Then we had live shots. So I don't want to get anywhere. So when you do the live shots, what happens? Oh, well, at the beginning, it started with every 12 hours you do a live shot. So you have 12 hours to put your piece together. Then it was every six hours. Then it was every four hours. And then when this came along, you guys know this? When we're in conflict, we just put it up. It used to be a satellite. Took 21 boxes because I used to travel with it, right? Now, it's just this, which means you're live every hour. Every hour you're live. If you're live every hour, can you think of how much time you have to gather the news? Right? That's a huge shift. Even when there's no electricity, this is on top of a cargo container in East Timor. Um, we were going live. These are things that, that really drastically changed reporting for us. And of course we know governments lie. Um, people lie. It's not just government. Everyone lies to a degree. There's a great book I'll tell you about later on. But this is hostile environment training in CNN. This was, I have my chem bio suit for a country that didn't have chem bio weapons, right? Um, which the United States acknowledged. John Ponte, I spoke with him a few months back. He said that was the greatest intelligence failure of the United States. But we all trained. We have our gas mask, we have our chem bio suits, and we embedded with the US military. So again, that's kind of interesting. These are just my takeaways. 
Indonesia was an incredible time from 95 to 2000. Why? Because um, there's so much misinformation and that's always part of conflict. And you cannot take apart intent versus skills. You've got to grow your journalists um, and their intent is part of Journalists hold a mirror to a society. You show me a society with critical journalists, it normally tends to be a more transparent <coughs> society. If they're not tra um, transparent, then you have journalists who told the lie. And that's a, a measure. So I remember here, and I'm sure Andy remembers this, um, when the conflict first broke out in Ambon, uh, one of the newspapers, I believe it was Compass, reported that 10,000, the number of people, and it was pro-Muslim, and then the Muslims went out and killed more people because of that. There are lots of things that happened during that time period. In Ambon, Indonesia, that was the first time we became part of the conflict, I think, because I'm, my name is Maria. I'm obviously Christian, right? And so I remembered walking into a mosque and then getting shut down, and then beyond that, getting an AK-47 um, pointed at me because of my name. So how did we navigate Ambon in 1999? We had one Muslim car with a Muslim soldier and his gun, and we had a Christian car with, with a Christian policeman and his gun. And they were off-duty policemen and off-duty soldiers, but it was like going through Beirut. You had to navigate the checkpoints, and you my team really was naturally, two of us are Christians and two of us are Muslims. Um, so that's how you do it. And how do you report it? Um, you report it pulling up to God's eye view because you cannot take a side. But again, that's not intent, that's skills, right? So those are some of the things. In South Asia, it was Muslims versus Muslims. I reported in Kashmir, I reported in, in Pakistan. Um, and again, just by saying my name, you get, you either get the interview, you don't, or you get shut down, or you're welcomed in. And the key thing there, if you're the reporter, is not to let it get to you, but to understand. Those are really our lenses. And I'm, I agree with everything Andy said, but the one thing I would put is that in the end, you cannot help who you are. The sooner you accept that, the better you'll be in your reporting. The Zamboanga siege is fascinating to me. This just happened. I think there's never been such prejudice against Muslims in the Philippines as now. Um, there's really great anti-Muslim sentiment now in Zamwanga, And I don't think that the government has done enough to address that, as neither has the Indonesian government done enough to address rising religious intolerance. And we've seen that from the early 90s until today, right? There are political reasons why they don't do it, but they're there. If leadership is there, it makes it much easier. If leadership is not there, what do you do as a reporter? You point it out. And then the last part I want to sh I want to talk about when it comes to conflict is there's this idea that we can control it. It's the ideas of governments in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Malaysia. I will tell you, it is not possible to control it, um, and it will become increasingly impossible to control it. Now, I mean, and I'll go back because these countries all had race riots to deal with. We all, you know, to a degree, it, it scarred some of the nations in the 60s, right? In Indonesia, you couldn't find, Indonesia's the only one that, has a, that had a Chinatown in 1998. It was fascinating. It's the only Chinatown in the world without Chinese characters. Um, you know, and, and, and what's interesting about this whole idea of control is, and you can take it apart, we can talk about this more later on, but, you know, in Singapore, every uh, HDB, the Housing Development Board, are are actually mandated um, for racial uh, and ethnic um, proportions. Does that work? It did for Singapore, um, but what do you do moving forward? And I think my solution, well, Indonesia, of course, we know what happened in Indonesia. We've, there have been major instances of riots uh, from the 60s to the late 1998, and in Malaysia, you've had your fill of it. I don't think it's control. I think it's about education, and I think it is about an empowered media, and I think it is not about censorship. Each of those countries flirted with censorship also. Saro rules in Indonesia, right? Um, you cannot censor because it's still there. 
In fact, at the fall of Suharto, what happened is it was like lifting the lid of Pandora's box. In 1998, I was moving from city to city to city talking about different types of conflicts, separatist, ethnic, religious, uh, you name it, right? So if you bury it, it will come back up and bite you. I think education is still the main thing. Um, I left CNN in 2005 because I wanted to go home. I was tired of writing about other people and what they were doing, and I wanted to try to do something. So I went and I headed the largest news group. It's a multimedia conglomerate in the Philippines called ABS-CBN. This was our newsroom, and what did we do in 2007? Um, we embraced the citizens, and this is a huge shift. Right? So we can still talk politics about it, but we don't have to deal with that now because technology provides some solutions to this. Today, if you're not reporting correctly or if you're pissing some people off, they'll come back and tell you immediately. Right? The citizen journalists, um, social media, uh, and this is where Rappler comes in. Rappler is less than two years old. We will turn three, actually will be fully two years old by the end of December, and it comes from the word, root words rap, to talk plus ripple to make waves. In less than two years, we've become the third top online news source because of social media. Mm -hmm. And I'll just show you, I think this works. <coughs> and these are the technological things you can tap. Our core is still professional journalism, technology. I think to be a media group now that survives, that, that does really well, you've got to be both media and technology. Because the technology exists to allow journalists to go beyond just telling stories, but also to harness, I think that's the activism part of what we can do now. We don't advocate for one thing, we allow people to build institutions ground up. We give voice to the people, far better now than before, and that leads to this part. The Wisdom of Crowds was a book, uh, but you can call it crowdsourcing. Wikipedia is an example of crowdsourcing, right? 2.5 million pages of, of an encyclopedia that has no formal editors, no reporters, no researchers, and yet it's there. It's now Encyclopedia Britannica stopped printing last year. And here's where we stand in Rappler. It's smack in the middle, and these are the technology things I want you to think about. We create content that is amplified on social media, which does the call for crowdsourcing. All of those little actions of crowdsourcing then become big data, and big data is the point that changes that goes right back into the circle for content creation. I'll give you a quick example before turning it over. This is the way Rappler looks on the front page. We're multimedia. You cannot be print anymore. You can't be just TV. You have to be all. So the front page has video as well as the print parts, but here's the part that makes it interesting, the crowdsourcing. And every single story on Rappler has a mood meter something journalists stay away from, right? And governments in our part of the world would like to think that if we touch emotions, we'll inflame. Emotions also inspire, inspire for actions, for positive change. And that's what this is. Neuroscientists say that up to 80% of how we make decisions as people is not based on what you think, it's based on how you feel. Advertisers have known that forever, right? That's why ads are the way they are. So we created this mood meter. Every story on Rappler has a mood meter, and there are eight emotions that are, that are um, chosen in conjunction with our Pulse. The Pulse Asia is a survey group, but we did it with psychologists and sociologists. These are the eight emotions. Click how you feel, and then in the middle of the front page is this mood navigator. The mood navigator chooses the top 10 stories that have gotten the most number of votes, places it on the front page, and it chooses the mood that has gotten the most number of votes in the last 24 hours. Then you can take all that data and in the month, you can put it per month or per year. In the month of May, I just chose the month of May because the Philippines had elections in May. If you take a look here, green is happy, red is angry, uh, purple is annoyed. Um, May 13th is our election day. So we were very happy leading up to election day, but on election day, we were angry and annoyed. <laughs> Why? The results came in very slowly, that's why, right? Then, look how happy people were on the day the results of the elections were announced. That's here. No anger. And then, this is what's interesting to me. At the end of the month of May, May 29th, uh, Filipinos got really angry again, and they were angry because a comedian 
crack the joke about a, a heavy broadcast journalist and about rape. And it really pissed Filipinos off. I mean, if you're Filipino, I'm referring to Vice Ganda and Jessica Sobo. Um, so look at that data. That data can do things, right? Um, this is data. Facebook. If you're, please tell me who is on Facebook in this room. Raise your hand. Okay, not bad. Who's not on Facebook? Three! Okay, if you if this was a room of 20-somethings in the Philippines, you would all be on Facebook. That's the demogra demographic in the Philippines. Our immediate age is 23 years old. But look at the stats, and this is what I mean by big data out of social media, just so you, you get it, not stop soon after. Globally, more than 10 million photos uploaded every hour. They, we click a like button or leave a comment nearly 3 billion times a day. 3 billion times. Let's look at YouTube. 800 million monthly users upload over an hour of video every second. How many seconds have I been speaking? That's big data. And then the last one is Twitter. The number of tweets grows around 200% a year. By 2012, this is the last um, numbers I had for it, it exceeded 400 million tweets a day. So how do you make sense of all of that? You do this. It's not a Rorschach test. This is actually human behavior on Twitter. You can map it. Imagine the things that allows you to do. This is all from 2011, which is part of what pushed me to set up Rappler in 2012. Hashtag Japan. You remember what happened March 2011 in Japan? The earthquake and the Fukushima reactor accident. This is the way our societies behave when crisis hits. It's the same pattern in the Philippines during our typhoons. We gravitate and form hubs of information. And most of the time, those hubs of information are government and news groups. That's where you get it. And that happens in every instance. Hashtag GOP is the American human superorganism. This shows you. This is six months before the last US presidential elections. And by pulling down the Republicans, you automatically map the Democrats and the Republicans. Is there no better visualization of how divided Americans were between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama? It's not something you make up, it's not a survey, this is human behavior, right? And then this is hashtag Egypt. That's what a revolution looks like. And if you look at it, every single one of these hubs are far smaller than hashtag Japan. Why? Because you're fighting the government. So they're smaller hubs. It's, I like to think about it like little terrorist cells. Now this one is interesting, hashtag Syria. 16 months after um, rebels began fighting President Bashar al-Assad. And then when I looked at this, this looks like a precursor to this. If this begins to look like this, does that mean we'll have a revolution in Syria? And I, it's another presentation to talk to you about the predictive powers of data analysis and what we can do, but it's there. I just want to talk to you about that and I'll leave you with just this one thing. This is Super Typhoon Haiyan. This is what it looks like from space. This is crowdsourcing that impacts the real world and I want to show that to you. This is what it looked like on the ground. We were not able, this is the first time in nearly 30 years that we were not able to communicate with an affected area for more than 24 hours. At most, four hours, maybe four hours. We never had communications cut off. When we did, this is what we found. I want to show you what you can do with this stuff. This is all on Rappler, but um, I'm going to pull it live and I'm going to leave you with that because it's really cool stuff. Um, you can track this is something we set up with Crisis Tracker, right? So this is the map of the Philippines. You can choose any one of these places and see every single tweet that came from that area. So that if you are looking for someone, if you are trying to find what's happening, you can see it immediately. Let me change it one more time. That's Masbate and here Mondragon. Again, you get different things for location, right? Geolocating tweets is still in its infancy, but you can do amazing things with it. I want to show you this. 
This is also on Rappler, but again, it just takes that Twitter stream and you can do things like this. You can cluster conversations and you can pull up exactly what's happened in one area and the related conversations with it. For disaster risk reduction, it's in incredible stuff that you can do and we're working with both the UN and the Philippine government to try to give this to you. This is what the front page of Rappler looks like. You've got that and then you've got the mood navigator that takes you. This is how you navigate the site. Let me end this with just... I don't want to take up too much time. Very quickly, you can categorize and map this. You, this is, there's all stuff on Rappler that you can see. You can categorize and map the tweets for disaster risk reduction. It moves faster than government because it uses everyone else. This is crowdsourcing to help save lives. Um, rescue mapping. People map when they need rescue, and they do it through their cell phones. Since there's 104% in cell phone penetration rate in the Philippines, it works. You can map relief operations and relief needs. This is a crowdsourced map, and you can see, you can see that on Rappler. Cell signals drop, so then afterwards, in the weeks after, we ask people to map cell signals. We ask them to map roads and infrastructure, and they did. Where is the road passable? Where is it not passable? And relief, what do you need? They mapped it. This is the last thing I want to show you. you working with Google and Facebook, that path of the storm had 220,000 people in it, and you lost contact with them. One of the greatest needs, which the government wasn't prepared to do, was to actually help find people, loved ones, who you can't contact. And what we did is we worked with both Facebook and Google, Google's Person Finder, and Facebook's facial recognition software. And we got someone on the ground, one of our team members, started just taking pictures of people wait, waiting on relief lines, waiting to get on the plane at the airport holding up a sign with how to reach them, and it's searchable. You can type in the person you're looking for and find them. This is what technology enables. And we report differently now because you have, it's an era of, uh, of bloggers, of social media. I'll just end with this. This is one of our reporters who actually was lost for four days and um, one of the worst things that you go through is the uncertainty when you're sending someone out, right? And I just want to show you his blog. So he was, he was basically, we had no content, we didn't know whether they were alive or dead. For four days, that's barely, that's virtually impossible. Even in a war zone, I was never out of touch with CNN that long. But look at what he wrote. This guy is, Bob knows him, Paterno Esmaquel, comes down with this. And this is, he's, this is the times we live in. We're covering, he, a day after he, he, he returned to Manila, and I was going, I slapped and hugged him at the same time, because he should have found a way to contact us. But look, they drove right back in, and he, he does this. Prayers is, it's part of our makeup. It's inspirational, it provides hope. I pray for the grace to help the people we meet. I pray for the strength, intellect, and heart to do justice to their stories. And I pray for stories that inspire and uplift, that bring hope and not only despair. Please pray with us as we make this long journey. I hope we can help you too in any way. Amen. That is the journalist today. That's our role. We converse directly with our audience. We work collaboratively with the government. But we always tell the truth. Because if you don't start with the truth, you can't solve the problem.